Hello everyone, welcome to a new session of the SAS Method online course. In this lecture, we are going to talk about communication with the technician. The first part is going to be focused on case prescription, how we should plan or how we should write those instructions for the technician in order to prepare a good first clean check or a good approver. Well, when we face a patient for the first time in the first appointment, we take all the pictures, x-rays, everything, and we create a treatment plan for that patient. We discuss with the patient if we are going to solve the class two, the class three problem, the posterior cross bite, if we need to do any instructions. And once we have decided the final treatment plan for that patient, it's time to start the virtual planning. And it's time to translate all this orthodontic knowledge to informatic knowledge. We should write all the instructions to the technician in order to prepare this first treatment plan. Well, so with this initial malocclusion, we want to finish with everything online, everything solved, and we should explain to the technician which aspects we are going to correct. As I said before, we should write if we need to solve the sidal problem, if we are going to procline or to retrocline and tear your teeth, all these aspects should be written on this initial prescription. We should write which are our goals or the treatment outcomes and how we want to correct those problems. If we want to do any sequential movements, if we want to place attachments, if we want to use buttons for elastics, anything should be written in this first prescription. And in these instructions, we don't need to write anything about orthodontics. Let me explain. If, for example, uh, we have a case in where we are going to place retromolar meniscus for distalize the upper arch, the technician doesn't need to know if we are going to use those meniscus or not. It's just for us. This information is for us. The technician uh, needs the information of how many millimeters do we want to distalize. If we want to do the distalization with sequential movements or everything at the same time, if molars are going to be distalized at the same time with the retro molar mini screw, if premolars are going to follow a 50% pattern distalization, for example, if we want to apply PIR protocol on anterior teeth, all those aspects are important for the technician. But if we're going to use elastics or mini screws to solve the sagittal problem, it's not important for him. Let's go with an example. Here we have a case in where we have an ectopic cannon and we want to create enough space to align this scanning. I don't want to extract any tooth here. We're going to maintain all premolars because he's class one, bilateral class one case. And if I decided to extract one premolar, I need to extract three of them to compensate the problem. If we decided to treat this case with premolar extraction, it's going to be a very complex case. So let's think about another alternative, another strategy to create a space. Here we can do many things. We can do upper sequential distalization, anterior proclination, some expansion, and all this knowledge or all this information that we know, we want to do it on the virtual planning and we need to explain it to a technician. If we are going to do some special sequences on this case, we should write them to a technician in order to achieve a better plan. In those complex cases, if we decided to do it everything simultaneously, proclination, distalization, expansion, everything at the same time, it's going to be impossible. We are going to receive less aligners than with sequences, but those movements are not going to be predictable. I used to compare those initial uh, instructions to the instructions that we use to build a furniture. For example, in this case, if we look at the first picture, the one of the left, we have all the pieces and on the second picture, we have the furniture finished. This is exactly the same process that we have when we start with an initial malocclusion and we finish with a perfect case. We need those instructions or the technician needs those instructions to create a proper treatment plan. And this is going to be our mission here. We should write everything, all the instructions, clear and short instructions to plan it properly, to create a predictable treatment and achieve those desired final results. So here we go back again with the previous case. And as you see, 
it's possible to do it without distractions and without moving all teeth out of the bone. We have strategies to create a space. Here I have applied distalization, proclination, expansion, and IPR. All of them applied in a sequential way. And when we are doing a case prescription, continue with IKEA furnitures, we have different situations. We may have easy instructions. For example, if we want to build that table, the instructions are going to be very easy. We're going to do it very fast. If we want to build that chair, the instructions are going to be a bit more complex. And if we want to build that wardrobe, it's going to be almost impossible for most of us. We are going to spend a lot of time and maybe we're going to need help for other uh, friends or other doctors to finish this furniture. With cases, is the same situation. Here we have different class two cases. All of them are class two cases, but the instructions are not the same for the first one, for the second, and for the third. For the first one, it's a very easy case. We just need to do some virtual jam, some mesialization of the lower arts, and place elastics to achieve this mesialization. We are going to ask the technician to solve the case just with virtual jump of the lower arts, simulating that mesialization effect of the class two elastics. In the second case, we have a full class two that is going to be treated with a combination of upper sequential distalization. I am explaining what type of pattern I want to, to apply in that case. And I'm also explaining or writing the limit of the distalization of the upper arch. I don't want to move the upper midline to the, to the right in this case. Because here we have an asymmetric class two. We have class one on the left, class two on the right. So if upper midline is centered from the beginning, and if we plan a lot of distalization on one side, we are going to move upper midline to that side. And here we don't want to do that. So we are going to combine upper distalization with lower mesialization. Again, I ask for buttons on canine and lower molar. And in the last case, that is the most difficult one, is like our wardrobe. Here we need to do or to ask for more instructions because we have to solve many things. We have to solve the class two malocclusion and the scissor bite. So here I'm going to explain how to, how to solve class two malocclusion with a combination of upper sequential distalization and some lower virtual jump. And also where I want to place the buttons for class two elastics and for mini screws but I'm not writing to the technician. I'm going to place a mini screw here, or I'm going to place a rich molar mini screw. The technician doesn't need that information. It's just for me. And I want to explain, or I want to ask also, how to solve the scissor bite. Scissor bite is a very difficult uh, malocclusion with aligners. So I want to apply some overcorrection. I'm going to finish this overcorrection with 3D controls, but for a first clean check, I can write some instructions to create this uh, overcorrection. I asked to finish here with an edge to edge relation with buckle cusps of the upper and lower arch. And as you can see, a case planning is not just a job for one person, it's a teamwork. As IKEA instructions said, we should work together. We should work with the technician and prepare all the instructions and help him to do it properly with clear instructions. And if we think on them when we are writing those instructions, everything is going to be easier. Here I'm going to show you some examples of case prescriptions. We have some outcomes. For example, when we have class two correction, we are going to write the strategy to solve this class two correction. For example, we can solve this class two problem with sequential distalization of 2.5 millimeters, applying a 50% pattern on the upper arch. I am explaining to the technician the millimeters of distalization, the way to distalize, and where I want this distalization. On cases with cross bite, cross bite could be solved with upper expansion, with lower compression, with a combination of both, with a Marby appliance, whatever. But here I'm going to solve it just with aligners and I want to limit the expansion on the upper arch. So I can write the technician, please make one millimeter of upper expansion by buckle crown inclination without exceeding zero torque on the posterior sectors. Solving the rest of the 
transfer problem of, of the cross bite with lower compression. Here I'm not asking for any type of overcorrections because we can write them, please apply six degrees or eight degrees or of buccal uh, root torque of upper molars. That's right. But I prefer to do it with 3D controls because on cross bites, it's more difficult to do it from the beginning. Those overcorrections should be planned carefully with 3D controls. And also an overcorrection for the lower arch compression is going to be applied, but I prefer to do it by myself with 3D controls instead of asking it to the technician. More examples. Cases with deep bite. On cases with deep bite, we can solve them by posterior extrusion, that with aligners is almost impossible, with anterior intrusion, and decide which teeth are going to be intruded. If the upper incisor display on a case with deep bite is correct, I don't want to intrude upper incisors because I'm going to flatten the smile and that is not going to be a good result of the orthodontic treatment. So I will write the technician, please don't intrude upper incisors. Solve the deep bite with intrusion of lower teeth and finish with zero millimeters of overbite. This is an overcorrection, but this type of overcorrection is easier than the one that the one that I want to apply on cases with crossbite. So here I write it to a technician, and then if I need, I will modify it with 3D controls. Crowding correction. On crowding cases, we want to translate the technician the limits that the, uh, he has for expansion or for proclination. Here I am explaining to to him to expand two millimeters per side in both arches and also use the distal side of 41, the initial position of the distal side of the 41 as the limit for anterior proclination. I am creating virtual walls on posterior sectors and on anterior teeth for achieve the final result to complete the crowding correction with those limits, with those walls. I don't want to move any tooth out of those virtual walls because those virtual walls represent the basal bone of the patient. And going back uh, with the previous case, here you have the virtual planning that we have asked for this patient. We have asked for upper sequential distalization, some anterior proclination, and then aligning the upper canine once we have created enough space for that. And those are the instructions that we have asked to a technician. My goal, my outcome is to align all upper teeth. But how are we going to do this? Aligning, leveling, everything at the same time? No, with sequences. The strategy is going to be this one. First, distalize one millimeter on each quadrant with sequential distalization. Then perform 0.3 millimeters of IPR between all upper incisors. In that way, I create enough space to reduce upper anterior proclination. I also ask to avoid round tripping movements on upper teeth because they are very common to, to see when we have these uh, severe crowding problems. So I want to avoid them in order to not procline more the 13. And also I don't want to extrude and lingualize. I don't want to move 13 until enough space is created for its alignment. And this is the superimposition. This tool is very important to understand what are the movements that we are planning. Here we see it very fast that we are expanding, we are proclining, but we are not doing excessive proclination or excessive expansion of the case. And when we look at this superimposition tool, we should check also the pictures of the patient, if the basal bone is correct or not. Here you see that everything is still inside the basal bone. Incisors are not excessive procline, so this final result is amazing. And the smile of the patient too. The second aspect to take into account for case prescription is patient references or limits. The four main points are midline position, upper and lower midline position between them, the relation between them, and also the relationship with the facial midline. The second point, incisor display or smile arc. How is the smile of the patient? If we are going to intrude upper teeth, extrude upper teeth, whatever, we need to do to improve this smile. 
the other reference or limit is going to be posterior torque and the basal bone of the patient. And also, from an AP view, we can check the incisor inclination on the lateral X-rays if they are excessively proclined or retroclined and if we need to do any modifications on them. When we ask the technician any changes uh, of this inclination, we should not write the instruction related with the lateral X-rays. We should not write, for example, finish uh, with 90 degrees of inclination of lower incisors respecting their basal bone. That is not the proper way to write it. We could write, uh, please procline them one millimeter or retrocline them two millimeters. But with numbers, it's easier for them to modify or to finish in a proper way. And for watching example of these references, let's continue with the same patient. Going to the historical pictures and looking at the smile of the patient, we can see that upper midline is deviated to the left because this asymmetric crowding, this ectopic canine, is moving upper midline to the left. Once we create enough space to align 13, it's going to be very easy to place upper midline in the same position as the facial midline. The deviation is less than 2 millimeters, and if we go to the intraoral pictures, here we get a lot of information for this case. We can see the basal bone of the patient. Upper and lower bone are very similar. We can expand around one millimeter per side, not too much, because the biotype is thin and there are some recessions on premolars and on molars. So the expansion here is going to be limited just with a slight crown inclination, finishing with zero torque, solving this slight uh, negative torque on posterior teeth. And then we are going to continue to create the space with upper proclination and also some lower proclination. When we create enough space to align upper uh, right canine, we are going to move upper midline to the left, but we are also going to use elastics to center lower midline with upper midline. And in the case that you can uh, make a CVCD to the patient, you can check here also the bone width. Here it's very easy to see that we have on the upper arch around 2 2.5 millimeters for upper expansion and on the lower arch is very similar around 2 millimeters of posterior expansion but this is not the more precise way to check or to review a CVCT. The better way to analyze the relationship between the roots and the bone is with those slices. Here you can see the cancellous bone, the cortical bone and the position of the roots related to them. If we see the difference between the cancellous and the cortical bone and where the roots are moving, we can plan the case in a more predictable way. Continue with all the patient data. We also check the lateral X-rays and here we are going to extract 28. This piece is overrouted and we don't need to maintain this molar. And we are going to use also this retromolar space to distalize one millimeter the upper arch. If we look at the lateral X-rays and check the inclination of upper and lower incisors respecting their basal bones, we can see that they are slightly retroclined, so we can do upper and lower proclination safely. Going again with some examples of how to write or how to transmit those references or those limits to a technician, we can face again different problems. For example, when we face midline deviation problems, we can write it in this way, how to solve this midline deviation. We can ask the technician to perform mid anchorage sequential distalization of the upper arch of one quadrant to move the upper midline two millimeters to the right. I am writing to the technician the final position of the patient on the upper arch and how to create enough space to achieve this anterior movement. Another example, when we have a patient with thin biotype or recessions and we don't want to do too much expansion because it's going to be very risky for him. In those cases, I'm going to write, please avoid buccal movement of the roots of premolars, canines and incisors. On molars to do some buccal root movements is not going to be very dangerous, it's very strange. 
to create a recession on a molar. But on premolar canines and incisors, it's easier to create those problems. So if I can control this on the virtual planning, it's going to be better for the patient. More examples, when, when we want to level all anterior teeth, but they are not at the same level, or which is the best reference to align them, incisal edges, gingival margins, whatever. In this example, I asked the technician to use gingival margins as a reference to align all anterior teeth and place canines and central incisors at the same level and move laterals one millimeter below them, looking at the gingival margin, to align all anterior upper teeth. The last example related with crowding cases, I ask again for another limit. As we have seen before, we can use one tooth as a reference. Usually it's going to be the more proclined one. For example, use the initial position of 31 as the limit for lower proclination. We are asking for a limit, but we also should give the technician a solution. The solution is make the necessary APR from mesial 34 to mesial 44 to align all anterior teeth and meet this objective. And continue with the case, here you have pre and post orthodontic result. Here we have center upper midline with facial midline. We have improved smile aesthetics. We have leveled all anterior teeth and using this template as a reference for our ideal final result, we can see on the right picture that we have achieved almost all the goals of this treatment. For a chief attempt to finish the case perfectly, the patient should wear veneers, but he's happy with this smile and he doesn't want to do anything else on his teeth. I always say that if my patients are happy, I am happy too. Okay, we have explained some basic aspects of how to write the instructions, how to use or how to translate all the orthodontic limits that we have on the cases. But now I want to focus on some instructions, some special instructions that are common to many cases and I used to write them on clinical preferences or in special instructions to apply them. Those instructions are the number of active aligners that I want on this first phase, movements coordination, round tripping movements and bolt-on discrepancy, how we are going to, to treat or to solve this bolt-on discrepancy. Let's begin with active aligners. The instruction that I used to write to the technician is please use the same number of active aligners in both arches. You can copy this. The movement rate of the arch where there are fewer movements will be reduced. This has a reason. If we do, for example, a case with 10 aligners on the lower arch and 50 aligners on the upper arch, movements cannot be coordinated. And upper and lower arch are always working together. The masticatory system is just one piece. Upper and lower arts bite, grind, all together, all days. And if we do different movements on one arch respect to the other, those movements could be less predictable. For example, if we look at those molars, we are expanding them simultaneously, but in a coordinated way in four different steps. If we expand the lower arch into steps and we expand the upper arch in four steps, that expansion is not going to be coordinated. Here we can see an example. Class two case. On the lower arch, we just have 16 aligners. What is happening between upper and lower molars? Lower molars are expanding faster than upper molars that could create interferences between upper and lower teeth. If we ask the technician to have the same number of active aligners in both arches, it's going to be easier for him to coordinate movements on the upper and on the lower jaw. Look at the evolution table and you see that all the movements on the lower arch finish on aligner 16. And from aligner 16 to aligner 39, those are passive aligners on the lower arch. Here we have the opposite example. In this case, we have asked to plan the same number of active aligners in both arches. And thanks to this, both movements are better coordinated compared to the first plan. 
Here we don't have any interferences between upper and lower premolars, for example. The expansion is doing more or less at the same time. And we also have intruded lower sevens at maximum velocity from the beginning to reduce interferences between upper and lower molars. And on the evolution table, we can see that those movements are delayed on the lower arch. They are doing the movements slower. Movements coordination. This instruction is related with the previous one. If we do not have the same number of active aligners in both arches and we have to solve sagittal problems, it's going to be very difficult for the technician to coordinate upper and lower movements. The written instruction is this one. Please coordinate both arches movements so that overlapping between upper and lower teeth is minimized as far as possible in the posterior region and no contacts between the anterior upper and lower teeth occur during their alignment. In crossbite cases, of course, it's impossible to avoid this ghost effect or, or this overlapping effect between upper and lower teeth. And here you have an example of this. In the planning on the left, we didn't ask for any special coordination and they are aligning upper and lower teeth without taking into account those prematurities or this ghost effect between upper and lower incisors. In this case, we also have different number of aligners on the upper or on the lower arch. In the second situation, the plan is different. Here we are aligning upper teeth from the beginning, but lower teeth are not aligned until we have enough space with lower sequential distalization. They are not aligned from the beginning because we know that they don't have enough space. They are going to contact with upper teeth during this alignment and two situations could occur. One of them is create a posterior open bite because of those anterior contacts or the other option is that the lower movements are not going to be completed and we're going to see some aligner mismatch. We're going to have tracking problems. And again, here we have the same number of active aligners in both arches to achieve this goal. Here we have more examples, more mistakes. Look at the left side, how the expansion is planned on this case. In this case, lower arch is expanded faster than the upper arch. That could create some problems. And as you can see on the evolution of the case, we have problems. Posterior settlement is really bad. And also the lower midline is slightly deviated to the right. Why? Because we have prematurities because of this strange expansion pattern. And this lower jaw movement to the, re to the left should be corrected with a new clean check. When I saw this, I rescanned the patient and make a new treatment plan. This is the new treatment plan. Here, you can see how posterior sectors are not occluding. We need to improve this occlusion. We have to solve this posterior open bite, and we also are going to solve midline shift. We are going to do more expansion on the left quadrant to create more space to the lower jaw to move again to the left side. This is a bit difficult to, to imagine or to, or to see. And it's also very difficult to ask to a technician. So I'm just focused on creating the liners, on create the expansion on both arches. And after this refinement, this is the situation of the patient. Now, posterior occlusion is perfect. The settlement is too much better on both sides. Look at also the left side is better even than the right side and both midlines are centered again. The final result is really good but even if we have improved a lot on this case we also should learn from our mistakes and here my main mistake was to didn't check how was the expansion plan. If we do expansion of the lower arch or the upper arch in a different way than the opposite arch we can face some problems like this. So don't forget, please, to coordinate every movement. Next point, round tripping. Here we can face two different. With round tripping movements, we may need them or may not. In case that we need to apply round tripping, or we can apply round tripping, we should write this instruction. Please make round tripping movements to align the anterior teeth. Start solving rotation during initial proclination with mesial or distal out movements at the same time as the proclination. Why? 
I want to, to ask this to the technician because when we procline anterior teeth, if we ask to do hinge rotations on rotated uh, incisors or canines, those movements are very predictable and we can start solving those rotations from the beginning. And we also are going to create better access to the interproximal contact if we need to do IPR. But in some cases, we cannot do round tripping. On crowding cases with periodontal problems, thin biotype, adult patients, when we have lower uh, anterior teeth procline, in those cases, I don't want to see round tripping because it's very dangerous to the patient. So the instruction for those cases is going to be avoid round tripping movements on the anterior teeth. IPR should be performed as soon as possible to achieve this goal, even if the access to the interproximal point is not optimal. We don't have to focus just on creating good access to interproximal contacts, because if we just focus on that, we are going to forget about the biological limits on the patient. And that is going to be more risky than not completing the IPR. In this patient, we have moderate severe crowding on the lower teeth, some crowding on the upper teeth, but in this case, we have enough bone to ask for round tripping movements on the lower arch. We can do this proclination with hinge movements on lower incisors to procline and solve the rotations from the beginning. It's possible to do it because the inclination of lower incisors is less than the ideal one. We have 86 degrees and the limit for lower incisor inclination is around 90 degrees. And look at the bone. We have nice and wide buccal bone here and this is a very important aspect to check when we are going to procline lower teeth we are combining intraoral pictures with lateral rays frontal diagnosis lateral diagnosis to create a 3d diagnosis for the movements of the lower anterior teeth and this is the virtual planning here we are doing this round tripping with distal out of 42 mesial out of 31 and all those hinge movements that are going to increase the predictability of the rotations. On the other side, we can have patients like this one. Here you see a periodontal patient, an old patient with lower incisors procline, thin biotype, and we don't want to do lower proclination here. We have a slight uh, crowding on the lower arch, but I don't want to do round tripping movements to solve this crowding case. I just want to align and retrude lower incisors from the beginning. And also this fact is very important here because I'm going to use class 2 elastics to solve the left class 2. If I use class 2 elastics from the beginning with, with this thin uh, cortical bone on the buccal aspect, we are going to procline more lower incisors. If we procline here lower incisors, it's 100% sure that we are going to create recessions on the lower teeth. If we counteract this mesialization effect with IPR and retrusion movements from the beginning, we can ensure that lower incisors are going to be at the same inclination or maybe with less inclination than the initial situation. It's going to be safer for her. And this is the clean check planning. Here, I perform the IPR from the beginning and start solving the rotations and doing the retrusion movement from the beginning. No distal out on 42, on 41. I know that this type of movement is going to be more predictable for the rotations, but here I prefer to reduce the predictability and increase the control over the lower incisor proclination. The last aspect to check is bolt-on discrepancy. What are the possibilities when we have a bolt-on discrepancy problem? We can treat this problem opening spaces for veneers or doing IPR on the opposite arch where we have an excess of tooth material. There are two ways to ask this instruction to a technician. On the first situation, we can ask the technician, please, solve the bolt-on discrepancy by IPR in the anterior region, from canine to canine. In many cases, IPR on anterior teeth is enough to solve this bolt-on discrepancy. In some extreme cases, we can perform IPR between premolars also or in an asymmetric way, but on most of them, doing IPR from 3 to 3 is enough. And 
In other cases, where we have peg laterals, for example, we are going to open spaces to place veneers after the orthodontic treatment, and those spaces are going to be open on mesial and distal of upper lateral incisors. Always try to open more space than the one that you need, because it's very difficult to achieve this space opening at 100% predictability. I recommend you to do a slight over correction of this space opening of around 15 or 20 percent. And don't forget to review the treatment planning because the Bolton analysis tool is not 100 percent accurate. I recommend you to check it on the clean check or the approver or any other virtual planning tool that you use. Here you can see an example where we need to perform a lot of IPR on the lower arch to solve Bolton discrepancy. This case is a class 2 case. Here we need to solve this uh, Bolton discrepancy because if we don't treat this Bolton discrepancy, class 2 correction is going to be impossible. We are going to have anterior contacts between upper and lower teeth that are going to block lower mesialization. Look that here I am overcorrecting the overjet and the overbite because both are related. And also I'm finishing with a slight class 2 because I want to solve part of the class 2 malocclusion with lower virtual jump, with lower mesialization. But this mesialization is going to be impossible if I don't have enough space between upper and lower anterior teeth. And look at the evolution of the patient. Now we have a slight class 3. But this slight class 3 is not a problem because we always have to take into account some relapse after stop using class 2 elastics. If we stop using 24 hour class 2 elastics, on the next appointment, we're going to see how this class 3 is going to be a perfect class 1. As we have discussed before, another option to solve a bolt-on discrepancy problem is to open spaces on mesial and distal aspect of upper laterals. Here we have small or peg laterals on the upper arch and 22 is smaller than 12. The spaces are going to be different on them, but we are opening more space than the one that we need to place veneers here because we want to increase the overjet and the spaces to place proper veneers here. With those spaces open, we are not solving completely the bolt-on problem here, but it's not a problem for this patient because we are going to finish with a slight class 2. The overjet is going to be enough to place veneers on those lateral incisors. Here is the final result of the case. We have enough space for veneers on both laterals and the case has been completed in less than eight months. And with this last part, the lecture is done. Now I just want to make a brief summary of all the contents of this lesson. Have very clear in your mind what are the goals of the case, what are the goals for the patient and how we are going to transmit those outcomes to a technician. Second point, references or limits. We are going to transmit to the technician all the biological limits of the patient in order to plan a safer treatment. Third point, general instructions related with some sequences or some common movements that we are going to ask to the technician to apply on our cases to improve the predictability of some movements. And fourth and last, CC, like clean check, clear and concise instruction. We should think like IKEA instructions for built furniture. Our instructions should be the same for our cases. Very clear, very concise and very short instructions to make the job of the technicians easier. Well, lecture done and see you in the next one. I hope that you're going to start applying all this knowledge in your cases. See you soon.